I have always wanted to tour the Naval Museum for years, but never made time until today. I wanted to see it as part of me paying respects to the military service personnel for Remembrance Day, which is November the 11th tomorrow. So if you've been in the military, I would like to thank you for your service. Now my understanding is the museum explores the role of the Mexican Navy throughout history, and it has a large section dedicated to the Naval Academy. Now, the Naval Museum is very conveniently located. You can find it just off the Malacan near the Los Arcos Amphitheater, right by the dolphin statues. The museum is open Monday through Friday from 10 to 7 p.m. and on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 to 5 p.m. However, the cafeteria that they have there is only open till 2 p.m. on the weekend. In 2024, the cost to enter is 60 pesos. Uh, for seniors and students, though, that cost is reduced to 45 pesos. As I said earlier, the museum has a small cafeteria and it's actually quite reasonably priced. They serve mostly breakfast items and lunch items such as sandwiches, a variety of traditional Mexican dishes and then drinks such as coffee and soft drinks. What's really good about it is the prices are extremely reasonable. The museum is divided into a number of halls. The first hall is really a, just an introduction to or a welcome by the Mexican Navy to the museum. And it describes their core values, which are honor, duty, loyalty, justice, and discipline. Honor, duty, loyalty, and patriotism. Those are the values of the Mexican Navy. So in the next hall, the museum starts off with a description of the maritime history of uh, Mexico. This is a dugout canoe, which was the primary mode of transportation along the waterways in pre-Hispanic times. This display here shows pre-Hispanic crafts. It looks like they're all various forms of pottery from bowls to different vases and so forth. Unfortunately, there's no date on the display, so I can't tell you how old they are. This particular display talks about pre-Hispanic navigation along the waterways and explains that dugout canoes were used for military purposes as well as commercial as all goods in, at that time were transported along waterways. This is a diorama of a famous Mexican naval battle. The battle occurred in the 1500s. It involved the conquistador Cortez and 14 brigantines supported by a variety of uh, indigenous tribes against one particular tribe that was dominant in the area. I believe this battle occurred just outside of Mexico City. The museum has many video displays where they describe the pertinent exhibit in the room. Fortunately for me, I'm an English speaker and all the displays and some of the interactive displays are only in Spanish. Good news is every one of the exhibits on display have a written description on the walls and the written description is in both Spanish and in English. This next room describes how in the time of the Spanish rule of Mexico, the establishment of trade routes between Mexico and China and how important that particular trade was to Mexico as well as Spain. This particular exhibit shows on the bottom some olive oil vessels, but on top they show a replica or a model of a sailing ship depicting all its different levels where people stayed or lived and the levels where goods were stored. You can see how tight and cramped those must have been if they had to sail all the way to China. Right here you can see an interactive display, it's a touch display and it will show you the trade routes that were taken by the Spanish ships to go to and come back from China to Mexico. This particular display actually talks about how those uh, trade routes were established and what their importance were to both countries. So to develop trade routes to China, King Felipe of Spain in 1557 sent out four vessels to determine what the best routes were to China and back. They uh, made their way to the Philippines and from the Philippines they were able to create new territories on these islands, develop trade with the neighboring Asian countries such as China. From there they could return their goods back to Mexico and then further on to Spain. Those trade routes, by the way, at the time took five months to to complete five months there and five months back but the value of the goods traded were so lucrative it really made it uh, plausible to do that. 
This next section of the museum talks about the origins of the Mexican Navy, talks about their commanders and the development of ports uh, where the Mexican Navy and other navigation uh, works could be done. What was really interesting to learn is that initially when they wanted a navy, there was no boats, they had to be constructed. So what the government did was hand out letters of mark. Letters of mark gave permission to ship captains to attack the enemy settlements as well as their ships and confiscate their goods. So by doing that, they actually were the first portion of the Mexican Navy. The map on the left here is of Veracruz, which was the most important uh, port at the time in Mexico. This next display describes how the Mexican Navy basically won independence for the country in 1825. Basically there was only one fort left which was controlled by the Spanish. It was at San Juan. It had been blockaded for two years and at that time they were basically lacking resources and armor. Spanish in 1825 tried to reinforce or resupply the fort. Unfortunately for them the Mexican Navy was there to prevent them access. So after the Spanish Navy was uh, forced to go back to Cuba, the fort at San Juan surrendered rendered and that was the last holdings of Spain in uh, Mexico. This next room on the left has a board which describes several wars or battles that happened between first with France and the next with uh, the USA. French when they couldn't establish uh, trade routes or trade agreements with Mexico decided to go to war with them. The war ended when a treaty was signed through mediation with the British. And this next section of the board describes the war, our battle with uh, the United States when territory was lost. The territory that was lost was California and New Mexico. This war that Mexico was involved with was again with France. At the time Mexico had a large debt with the countries of England, Spain and France. The sp Spanish people as well as the English came to an agreement. Mexico. However, the French would not agree, so they invaded. Took the capital in 1863, surrendered in 1864, at which point Maximilian of Habsburg took the throne in the name of France. During the reign of Maximilian, the government was under threat by rebels in the name of Benito Juarez, supported by the U.S. In that time, Maximilian built up the navy. Ultimately, he failed. This next part of the display is just some French furniture as well as some pictures of Maximilian and his wife uh, from the time in the 18th century when Maximilian was in charge of uh, or the sovereign of Mexico. This next room describes the founding of the Naval Academies in the 1880s. This next uh, display shows what the naval uniforms uh, looked like as well as their caps. They had a hard cap and a soft cap here. So in the 1880s when the academy was formed, the president at the time was Diaz. Uh, he commissioned the uh, academy and had ships built in France uh, for the cadets to learn uh, their skills. Since they really didn't have a navy at the time, they used the uh, military schools. Uh, I guess the army, I guess, would be the best way to say it. They taught naval courses at that, those particular schools. And then on the far wall, it talks about the Perifrio Diaz uh, period. It's the period in which the president, Perifrio Diaz, was uh, in power from 1876 to 1911, and he was the gentleman that basically led the, the founding of the Naval Academy and the further development of the Navy in Mexico. This next room is all about navigation. So the earliest form of navigation used the stars. So that's when you had these sailing ships who sailed across the world. And the only way they knew what place they were from was the location of the stars. So at that time, if you had knowledge of the stars and constellations, you could know exactly where you were in the world. And if you had those skills, you were in high demand on ships. This is actually a quite interesting room here. The, the ceiling and some of the walls are, are illuminated and they basically depict the, the nighttime stars. stars. And uh, in this particular case, you can see replicas of what typical sp uh, ships, sailing ships looked at the time. And on the far wall here, learned about the history of the word orientation. Orient literally means taking the east where the sun rises.
So navigators use this point as a point of reference. Later on, with the invention of the compass, which used magnetism of the poles as a reference, the north became the point of reference. This next display case held a, a variety of sextants, and sextants are a device which uses the stars and the horizon to determine your position in the world. Off this last room, there is a video room where they show uh, a movie, essentially, I guess would be the best way to describe it, and it's about mythology where sailors who were very superstitious at the time believed there were sea monsters out there, and uh, this particular video is a gives a depiction of what they believed or thought at the time. A little bit of fun, I guess, for the museum. As you exit the navigation room, you'll pass by some Navy rifles, and you'll enter the cartography or map room. Room uh, discusses the development of maps. They have a display that shows how maps evolved and were improved over time. Most of the improvements coming along with new technology such as global positioning systems, GPS and other terms, uh, and using that technology to advance the science of map making. Completes the first floor and now we're going up to the second floor of the museum. The first major hall on the second floor has to deal with a recreation of the Naval Cadet Building in Veracruz in 1914. The exhibit here describes how cadets were mobilized in 1914 when there was a conf confrontation with the USA. Apparently Mexico held some American sailors and when the US uh, demanded them back, which they did return, they also asked for apology in the form of a salute to the US flag. In return, the Mexicans demanded that if we salute your flag, you must salute the Mexican flag. The U.S. refused that, that, so an engagement was conducted after this. At this time, the president of the USA was Wilson, and uh, he requested a de declaration of war against Mexico. But uh, he did not get that declaration before he attacked. He attacked was that the uh, Mexicans were being rearmed at that point and he wanted he learned of this and he wanted to uh, attack before that reinforcements took place due to the size of the the force of the Americans that were coming into Veracruz uh, the Mexican military abandoned Veracruz However, a, a senior military officer on his way from Mexico City only learned of that when he arrived. So when he arrived, he mobilized the 80 cadets were, which were at the dormitory at that particular time. And they stood behind their windows and they fired at the American sailors, killing some. Unfortunately, they were also killed in the process. Population in Veracruz also mobilized and they uh, attacked the Americans as well. But the Americans, being a greater force, uh, basically won the day. So this entire room commemorates that particular battle. This next room describes war during the Mexican Revolution. Of interest, though, is the fact that uh, they had a naval engagement that also involved an airplane. That airplane was a biplane, uh, and it had uh, occupants on it who would drop bombs or explosives by hand on top of the ship. And because they did that, and uh, navies at that time were not equipped to fight aircraft, uh, they retreated. So I believe it was in 1940 and it's one of the first that recorded air, I guess, airplane naval engagements uh, in the history of the world. This next section of the museum talks about naval uniforms. Uh, they show uniforms from various times, from the 1800s through the 1900s. All the uniforms are from uh, naval officers, captains, and so forth. In this one particular display case, you can actually see how they change with time. Most of these uniforms are dress uniforms as well. This particular wall shows a timeline from 1821 to 2014 when the Naval Museum in Mexico City was, was open, but the prior items list all the infrastructure that was built to support the Navy. 
on the far wall here you actually see I believe these are current uniforms for the Navy Marines in Mexico and in this display case you can see some uh, uh, an old naval sword and sashes and in this display case you can see shoulder opulence worn by officers as well as a number of different medals and awards uh, given to service members now this is the final room of the museum it's actually quite large and the most striking thing are scale models of all the typical navy ships uh, currently uh, that used by the mexican navy but they also have some historical ships if you look to the far side of the room they have some sailing ships uh, masted schooners which are used by the academy to train uh, the young uh, cadets in the the ways of the sea they want to give them first-hand experience I guess experience. Uh, what was a lot of fun in this particular uh, section of the museum though was this uh, maritime or ship simulator. So you actually have controls of a large ship in front of you. Basically you have uh, two thrusters, sort of I guess a port and starboard side motor, a map in front of you, and then different uh, simulations where you could press a button and simulate different weather conditions like rain and fog. Sound uh, a horn, you could change the intensity of the rain, the fog, you can go from day to night conditions as well. The idea here is to use the thrusters and drive around the harbor without hitting anything. Actually it was a lot of fun. I think uh, if you had some kids along they would probably enjoy it. So this is a picture of the masted uh, sailing ship that the Academy purchased to train their new cadets. They really wanted to give them a first-hand knowledge of how the, the sea really works, its currents, its winds, and one of the best ways to do that, uh, and navies around the world have done it, has purchased these masted schooners and give training to all the cadets on these schooners so they really get a, ha get a hands-on experience of how wind and water work and how it affects their ships. this particular plaque actually talks about what went into uh, the purchase of the massive schooners for the cadets uh, why they purchased it and when it was built and so forth the new massive schooner was built and launched in 1982 that completes our tour of the museum with the exception of the gift shop and cafeteria so in the gift shop you can purchase a variety of souvenirs and you can also grab uh, breakfast or lunch. They serve eggs, different styles, uh, different types of Mexican food, and of course, coffee and other beverages.